Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's make sure that our lighting is good here. Ooh. I want to be able to read. Oh dear. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Thank you, Jesus. We thank God this morning for the presence of the Lord. I love to sing, but I'm apparently I'm not allowed to sing. I'm here I'm on Facebook, anyways. So, um, welcome to the Bible Dive, guys, with Jack today. I am running a little bit late today, as well, <laughs> seems to be a little bit my norm these days, but I may have to change my timing. But for now, it is what it is. We are in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and 11 today. I believe that's where, yeah, yesterday we did chapter 8 and 9. Bless the Lord Jesus Christ. So today we're in 10 and 11. We're moving along, guys. And then tomorrow is the last of this particular uh, book of um, the Bible. So 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Bless the Lord. This day we're going to pray and then we're going to get started. Mighty Father, I give all praise and all honor to your glorious name, this name that is above every other name. The name by which you have given us, Lord, that we can access you is Jesus. The name by which you have given us, God, that we can and must be saved is Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we just come in that precious name mighty God and we thank you that we have this opportunity to come before you Lord and that there is no restriction we can come boldly to the throne of grace we come Lord with everything that we have and we surrender all at the cross today mighty God I ask that you will have your dominion and your way by ourselves we are nothing we can do nothing but in you we are strong in you, O oh God, we are more than conquerors. In you, O oh God, we triumph, O oh God, because you always cause us to, to triumph in Christ. Have your way today, Lord. Teach us your word. As I open this Bible today, Lord, it is my daily bread that I seek today, O oh God. Jesus, and you said that if we ask, O oh God, you, the Heavenly Father, know how to give good gifts to your children. You will not withhold it from us, Lord. And so today, we pray that you will unveil to us in your word, God, the necessity, that which is necessary for our daily bread, that we will live by it today, Lord. I seek you for more of you, O oh God. I seek to know you, to understand you, to know the power of your resurrection, Jesus Christ. I seek, O oh God, to be filled with your fullness and with your love and to walk out that love in Jesus' name. Have your way today, we pray. We say thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Please go ahead, tap your screens, invite somebody to the live, like, whatever you do, just help us, um, help in your doing your part to spread the word of God today. Every day I sit here as I come, I am not coming with any preconceived notions or ideas as to what God is about to say. I'm just reading the scriptures and as the Lord leads, so I speak. And so I'm empowered by it. And I pray that you will be empowered by it today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to those who are here, those who come on a regular basis. And those who might be new today, even on Facebook, on TikTok, we just welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so yesterday, this light is not my friend, but... <laughs> and so yesterday, we did chapter 8 and 9. And it was just wonderful. So we ended with the verse 15 that said, Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. And we spoke about that unspeakable gift being Jesus Christ, the gift of God to us. Amen. And um, without that gift, we would not have any access into the presence of God. Amen. So it is an amazing gift. It's unspeakable. We can't even express it. It's unfathomable. This gift, why would God choose to save you and I and to send his only begotten son? 
that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have eternal life. And the Bible tells us that it is, um, in the book of Acts, that it is God, amen, God that purchased the church with his own blood. So we know that Jesus Christ is God that came in the flesh. If you ask me, and if you ask anybody, you said, does God have blood? They would tell you no. But the Bible tells us that God purchased the church with his own blood. At what point did God have blood? When he came to this earth in the person of Jesus Christ. When he put on flesh and was born through the channel of the Virgin Mary. Amen. This is a mighty God that we serve. A sovereign God. Bless the Lord Jesus. And so today, we worship that great and wonderful God. No other God before him. Amen? Bless God. And so we go on into chapter 10. And it says, Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence um, base among you, talking about himself, he says, When I'm among you, you know, I humble myself, I'm based among you, but being absent, I am bold towards you. You understand? So Paul says, when I come to you, when I visit you in person, I humble myself, I come gently, I'm based among you. But when I'm absent, he says, I am bold towards you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. So Paul says there's some folks in the church, in the church of Corinth, that was thinking that they were not being led by the Spirit. Everything he said and did was flesh, was by the flesh, his own desire and his own will. He says they think that we walked, we are walking according to the flesh. For though we walk, he says, in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. So when I come, I'm not, I, I, I pray that I won't be as bold towards you as I am thinking that I should be. Because you see, in, if, if I respond to you in my human flesh, it's not going to be pretty. So I'm going to come to you in the spirit and meekness of Jesus Christ, he says. For though we walk in the flesh, we are living in this this temple called flesh, yet our warfare is not against flesh. And that's what we have to recognize as believers in Christ, that whatever obstacle we come up against in our walk with the Lord, we are not fighting flesh. So we need to stop fighting each other. We need to stop fighting our brothers and our sisters and hating on them because we think that they did us something wrong. We have to understand that as believers in Christ, we are not fighting a war of flesh we're living in the flesh but our operation is in the spirit realm amen for though we walk in the flesh we do not war after the flesh for the weapons guys and it's pluralized there weapons not just one god doesn't send us out to war and send us with just a slingshot he has equipped us the bible says with everything that we need Amen. And so for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, fleshy, not human built. It didn't come from, we didn't have to buy this from China. Good God Almighty. The weapons of our warfare were not shipped from overseas. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You see, the world today have all kinds of weaponries. They have this whole talk about gun violence and how much, you know, the government is trying to cut down on that. And everywhere you look, they don't, they, people keep, no matter, I mean, I wouldn't know where to get one. For example, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. I'm that, I'm that crazy. I'm that silly. But people know, they know how to go out and to buy weapons and to, you know, do whatever. They find ways to get these weapons, right? To equip themselves. I was watching a program 
shortly yesterday I was passing by the television at work and I was seeing that they were talking to a bunch of women and different people, men and women. Why is it that they own this weapon, a gun, right? And they were all giving their reason, their experiences, why they needed, what they saw happening around them or in TV and how somebody else was, was, was mugged or attacked. And so they decide to go out and get themselves equipped. You understand? But we who are, amen, we who are children of the living God, our warfare and our weaponry is not of this earth. It is not carnal, but we are equipped with weapons that are mighty through God to pull down every stronghold. So we recognize now that we are fighting against spiritual stronghold and not individuals, not people who we say, oh, sister so-and-so did me wrong or brother so-and-so did me wrong or this person in talk about me wrong. So I'm going to get them back. No, that is not the weapons of our warfare. So our warfare, guys, our weapons are, 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 are effective to casting down imaginations. Every imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, we have been given the authority against that to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. In our world today, we see this going on. Everybody is puffed up and bloated up against God. They think that they are bigger than God and they have they, they exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. They seem to think that science explain God and that, you know, everything that we say about God, well, you know, that's not what the scientists say and that's not what history shows and science say. And so they want to exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. But we have been given and equipped with the, the, the weapons of our warfare that will cast down these imaginations and that will bring these things under subjection, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing it into captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. That is why the Bible tells us that God has used what the foolishness of preaching to reach those people, those people who think they are high and they're big and that they, they don't need God, but God has given the foolishness of preaching that by the weapons that he has given us our weapons are we, we we come equipped that's why we have intercessors and we have people who know how to get into fasting and prayers we know we have people who are able to get into the word and preach the word of god weapons of our warfare guys that will bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. We must be ready when we have fulfilled our obedience. We have committed to Christ and obey the voice of the call of the Lord. And so we now have turned to him in faith. Now we must be ready to go out there and to bring folks in. Punish every disobedience. Bring it into the captivity of Jesus Christ. Bring them into obedience. Do you look on things after the outward appearance, he says? If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, you think that you belong to Christ, he says, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. Don't just think of yourself. You are Christ. You belong to Christ. But he says, we also belong to Christ. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification, right? God has given them, he says, um, this authority to edify the church for edification and not for your destruction. So when we preach the gospel, it is not to destroy you. When we say bring them into obedience and we are to punish disobedience, it's not for them to be destroyed, but rather to edify them and to bring them out of the bondage and bring them into the knowledge of Christ, bring them into the obedience of Christ. So he says, we have been given, the Lord hath given us um, this authority for edification. I should not be ashamed that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by my letters. 
when I write these letters to you, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to, if, if, if you're scared, I hope you're scared straight when you hear about what Christ has done upon Calvary's cross for you. And what is the judgment and the punishment that awaits those that reject Jesus Christ. For his letters, say they, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. So they were talking about him. When he's in our presence, he seems so weak and contemptible. But when you read his letters, he sounds so powerful and so scary. Let such an one think this, that such as we are in word by letters when we are absent such will we be also indeed when we are present for we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves he says we're not comparing ourselves with those people who walk around patting themselves on the back putting themselves up trying to say how great they are and how wonderful they are we are not making any such comparison but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise you can't know how great you are if you're comparing your greatness to your own self. Compare it against the against somebody who's greater than you. Then you will see how truly how great you are. But we will not boast of things without our measure, he says. But according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. We're not going to go measure ourselves by our own rule, or our own yardstick. We are going to measure ourselves based on the measure that God has given unto us. So our word, the word of God is the plumb line by which we, the believers, are to measure ourselves. If we, if when we apply ourselves to the plumb line of the word, we find that we are out of kelter, it means that you need to get right with God. You need to repent if your actions and your behaviors and your lifestyle does not measure up to the plumb line of the word of God, then you know that you have to get yourself right with God. So he says, this is the measure by which we measure ourselves. We are measuring ourselves, not comparing ourselves to others, but let me see myself in light of the word of God. Amen. For we are come, he says, for we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure as though we reached not unto you. For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. Whatever we do when we preach the word, we do what God tells us to do. We go as far as he tells us to go. Amen. And so we are not going beyond our measure. That's why it is important. I speak this before. We need to stay in our lane. Whatever it is that you, 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 you have to pray and seek God. What is the ministry that he's given to you? What it is that you are called to? And you stay in the lane and let God use you in that capacity. If God did not call you to start a church and go run a mega church, then that's not your calling. Don't, never mind the fact that maybe you might get rich doing it. That's not your calling. You need to stay in your lane. Not boasting of things without our measure. That is... Not boasting of things in our, without our measure, uh, you know, that's not within our measure. That is of our other men's labors. So if somebody else is doing a job, don't attach yourself to it and start to boast how, look how good we are doing. You understand? But having hope when your faith is increased that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. To preach the gospel in the region beyond, that's it, that is the call, mighty God. To preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. So a lot of churches, and I've seen this guys, where a lot of churches, for example, church is going on over here. I've seen it. And instead of, you feel that God is calling you to do a ministry, instead of stepping out on faith and let God lead you and start to preach and bring sinners to repentance, you're going to pull out. 50, 100, 300 people out of one church cause disruption in the church and then split the church down the middle. All of a sudden, 300 people following you because they're, they're blind, you know, and they follow you to go to start a church. And they think that they're doing a great job because they have started a church and they're doing so good because look, we have over our first day we opened, we have over 300 people. But you are boasting in another man's labor. 
You understand? As opposed to going out there and starting from scratch and let God bring the numbers in. So he says, we should not boast in another man's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased. Increase your faith in God and watch God work on your behalf that we should be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. To preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Everything that we, we have that we think we can glory about, it has to be in Christ. That's why I teach the gospel of you can't work for your salvation. Salvation is of the Lord. You cannot try to do righteous, do good in order to be saved because salvation. Otherwise, you're going to glory how good it's because of your goodness. It's because of how sanctified you are. It's because of how many hours you spend on your knees. It's because of what you are going to glory in yourself. And then the glory does not go to God. It means that you have put yourself in the place of God. You're just as bad as Satan. You understand? So you cannot depend on yourself for any glorying. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends. It is not you who's going to stand on that day before God and say, look at me. Look how wonderful I have lived for you, God. God says some of them are going to say, Lord, Lord, did I not cast out demons in your name? Did I not preach? And did I not do this? Get away from me. Depart from me. I don't know you. Because the thing is, it's not you who will commend yourself to God. God is the one that must commend you. And therefore, when Jesus says, I am going to present you faultless before the throne of glory with exceeding great joy, he is the one who is going to what? Commend you to God, present you. It is not you who is going to go up there bragging about yourself, how wonderful you have lived for the Lord. Amen. So get that nonsense out of our brains right now that we think we are so much holier than such and such because we have been staying in church for how long and because we've never been to a club. I've never been to a club. And so what? And so what? Who cares if I was born on the front pew of a, of a church? Who gives a hoot in Flint if I was born on the front pew? Seat of or even on the rostrum for that matter. You understand? Because your glory must be about God and what he did for you. That's why Jesus came to redeem all mankind. The Bible says he died for all. Amen. He died for all that all could be saved. And then he says, whosoever will let him come. You understand? And draw from the, from the waters of life freely. There is nothing for you to do but draw out. Amen. Blessed be the name of Jesus Christ. It's like if you go to a, um, to a buffet or a, or a potluck and, and, and then, you know, the food is prepared, everything is good and you are just, all you have to do is draw out, take what you want, sit at your table and eat. And then you're going to sit there and start to glory in the fact that the food tastes so good and you are taking all the glory for it, for preparing it. You weren't even there when they were cutting up the lettuce. You understand? God did it all for you and I. He did it all. And so he has handed us down a free salvation. Nothing for us to glory about. And so, would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly. That is, Paul is continuing his discourse. He says, would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly or my foolishness. And indeed, bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. Paul says to them, I am jealous over you with what? Godly jealousy. I want you to have the best in God. I want the best for you in God. I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. Oh, 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 all right, let me go for, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy for I have exposed you to one husband. Who is that one husband? Jesus Christ. He is the groom, right? We are the church, the bride of Christ, right? And 
so Jesus Christ is going to present us before the, the, the throne of glory with exceeding great joy. So we are the ones that are the groom, are the, are the bride. The bride of Christ is the church. And so Paul standing in the place of Christ saying to the people, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. Jesus Christ himself has that same jealousy for the church. He does not want, that's why he says he, he, he has exposed you to one husband. That's why fornication and adultery is so despicable to God. Because it's one and the same as when we turn our back on him the groom and go out there and begin to live our lives for the for satan begin to get into relationship with the devil and with 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 devilish things amen that means we are committing adultery against god a fornication against god it is despicable because i have exposed you to one husband that i may present you as a chaste virgin to christ Amen. That I may present you as a chaste virgin. You know, the Bible says that when you come to Jesus Christ, you must be born again. Hello, my dear. Hello, my dear. I hear you. You have a question. Go ahead and put up your question. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. So God, Jesus Christ says that, um, you know, we, we must be born again. When you and I were born, okay, when we came out of our mother's womb the first time, we came out as virgins never been touched okay the the, the um you know anyways you understand the whole the whole um stuff what i'm talking about never being touched the man has never seen been with a woman the the girl she's never her, 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 her the little thing that's over her, 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 her body part there that shows that she's still a virgin has never been broken so therefore she was a virgin she was born a virgin Paul says, I want to present you as a chaste virgin in Christ. We, when we messed up, when man messed up in sin, it's like man lost his virginity to the devil. We were no longer chaste virgins. But when Jesus came and paid the penalty for our sins, we get the opportunity through Christ to be born again. When you come to Christ and you are born again, you are restored to your original state of being a virgin in Christ. Amen. And so Paul says, I want you to continue in that way so that I might be able to present you a chaste virgin. Don't get yourself now messed up back with the devil. Sell out your body, your your time, your everything to the devil again. Let me read this person's question before I move on. Bless the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So he says, I come from Ghana, Ghana family, and, I'm, and uh, I don't understand why I should be Christian knowing our history. All right, let me understand this. We were proselytized by Christian missionaries from Europe. Okay. And um, so you're saying that because knowing the history that there were some people that actually took advantage of 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 your um, your 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 people or whatever, and you guys were prosel pro sorry I can't pronounce the word proselytized I get it by Christians missionaries from Europe. So that means you feel like you shouldn't you don't know why you should become a Christian. All right. Most Africans, that's right, that's right, that's right. Now, listen, it, it is a very good question. It's a very, very good question that you ask. For me to tell, first of all, were you proselytized by Christians or are you talking about the history, the history, people in your past? It's like me saying that as a black person, I don't know why I should interact with or be with you know, and uh, the other cultures, white folks, because of what was done to my people in history. You understand? It's, it's like that. If I put it that way, that's foolhardy because honestly, my history, my past, people in the, in of old went through a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. People went through a lot of stuff. But the fact of the matter is, let me tell you something. We are not teaching you about Christianity. I'm not talking about Christianity. I'm telling you about being um, born again and salvation. We are talking about your eternal soul. 
and that salvation was is is comes through Jesus Christ okay now because there are folks that may have used the gospel for the wrong reason doesn't make the, the gospel of none effect because people have used the gospel for the wrong reason does not make it of none effect salvation is of the lord and if we reject jesus christ on this earth he will reject us before his father that is truth there is nothing else that you can override that it is the truth there is a god and he came into this earth in the person of jesus christ to pay the penalty for your sins now i am sorry that in the past people have done wrong with the gospel but that's satan satan has always tried to find a way to corrupt what god's plan is for humanity and so even if he has to use the very even people will come disguised the bible tells you that there will be some that will attach themselves to the church call themselves christians but they are not of god they are actually wolves in sheep clothing so maybe in the past, as you're saying, wolves in sheep clothing has attached themselves to the church and used the gospel for their own gain. Leave those people to God. They are going to pay a penalty for their sins. But you have a choice to make. The thing is, the Bible says that you, you must, it says, I put before you two paths, one that leads to death and one to life. Therefore, I say to you, choose life. He says it in the scripture. I say to you, I am not talking to everybody. Each individual must make a decision for himself. You must choose Christ for yourself. So if you stand before God on the day of judgment and he says to you, the gospel was preached to you. I remember that day when this girl called Jet was online talking to you about Jesus Christ and about your salvation and your eternal soul and how it is important that you choose Christ and be born again. Why did you not accept my son? Now you're going to say, well, God, you know, I heard the history of how they have used our, you know, the Christians proselyted. And so that's why I didn't choose it. Do you think that's going to stand up in the court of God? Do you really think that will stand up? Oh, glory to God. Mighty God, I hear the Holy Ghost. Do you believe, guys? I, I tell you, it is so important that we understand. It will not stand up in the court of God. No excuse. I say this over and over. You will have no excuse. Because you know why, why we can say that God is just? Because he is just. He is just. And he has made every provision for your salvation. When you and I could not pay the penalty for our sins because we were too messed up in sin. The Bible says that we were dead in trespasses and in sin. So if you are dead, you cannot help yourself. So God himself made a plan and put on flesh. He himself came and come into the world to put on flesh, to die upon the cross of Calvary so that you and I could be saved. That means he has done everything everything when jesus laid down his life he said it is finished man's redemption is paid nothing left to be done he did it all it is finished and all your part is to accept the finished work of jesus christ to accept it by faith because by grace are you saved through faith grace is jesus who came into the earth so by jesus are you saved through faith your faith and that not of yourself the self the faith does not come out of you but god has given to every man a measure of faith so by faith by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself but it is the gift of god the very gift of god the very faith to believe is the gift of god and the fact that jesus came he is the gift of god to you and i you and i will have no excuse why we did not accept jesus christ as our lord and savior you understand? I could not go into the natural court and say, why is it that you did such a wrong to this person of this, this race, you know? And I say, well, because I read the history that when in, in the past, they, you know, they're the ones who hurt, you know, Martin Luther King. They're the ones who, who, who did all these negative things and, and, and treated bad, you know, the, 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 this, the, our culture and put us through all kind of stuff and slavery. So yeah, that's why I decided to hurt this person. Would that hold up in court or will I end up for a life sentence in, 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 in prison?
You understand? We have to be careful, guys. This is God Almighty. If before man, your little excuses don't hold up, how do you expect it to hold up before God? He has given us all things that is unto life and godliness. He made it possible for you to be saved. And now he has made it impossible for you to have an excuse on, the, on judgment day. So I would admonish you, forget about the history. We are not supposed to be looking back anyways. Remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. She was being delivered out of bondage to be delivered into freedom and she stopped to look back and she turned into a pillar of salt Rem and then the scripture says remember lot's wife remember it because if you have been given the opportunity now to be saved but you're looking back in history you're like lot's wife my friend looking back in history at what was done to by christians uh, who were not even christians people who did not know um take the truth of god and did not want to repent they weren't living for god they were being led by the devil when they did what they did so they don't represent this gospel you understand don't look back at those things we are to look forward paul says i will press towards the prize of the mark of the high call of god in christ jesus that is where your vision should be look forward david says i will look unto the hills from whence comes my help my help comes from the lord who makes the heaven and the earth that's where your focus should be stop looking back Remember Lot's wife. That's all I'm going to say about that in Jesus' name. Glory to God. So let's get back to chapter 11. And I hope I answered your question. Mighty God. But I fear, Paul says, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. Listen to this carefully. Paul in chapter, in chapter 11 verse 3. He says, I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, sub subtlety, that's what the, the devil is doing even now, bringing up history to people. He's very subtle. He doesn't want you to accept the truth. So he will point back to history and show your foolishness. Get your mind in Christ. Satan is, is beguiling people like he beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your minds should be corrupted. My God, I didn't even, let me read this. This is crazy. This is answering your questions right now. All right. So that's what the devil is doing. He's trying to corrupt the mind from the simplicity that is in Christ. He's trying to corrupt your mind. And so all of a sudden you can't accept this gospel because, oh, well, Satan is showing you what happened in history. Or he's telling you that Jesus, how, is, how could God possibly put on flesh and come into the earth? Like he's not God, you know, like, so this is the subtlety of the enemy guys. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that comes preacheth another Jesus, if somebody come to you and talk to you about some other Jesus, right? which we have not preached. So if they're not talking about Jesus the Christ who went to Calvary's cross for your sins, if they're talking about some other Jesus, you know that that's, what, that's the doctrine of a lot of religion. They talk about Jesus and you say, oh, but they believe in Jesus. You know how many times I hear um, the, the, the people who are Muslim say, well, we believe in Jesus. Which Jesus? Because you're not preaching the Jesus that I know because the Jesus I know and the, the Jesus that the Bible teaches is the one that went to Calvary's cross and laid down his life for my sins. Yet you tell me you believe in Jesus, but you tell me that he didn't go to Calvary's cross and you tell me he didn't die. So which Jesus are you preaching? You understand? So Paul says, for if he that comes preaches another Jesus, be careful of which Jesus you're hearing about and accepting. Because the Jesus that you accept must be the one that came on this earth by the Virgin Mary through God Almighty and then went to Calvary's cross, laid down his life for your sins, said it is finished, man's redemption is paid, resurrected on the third day and was caught up to heaven. He's now seated at the right hand of God making intercession for you and I. That's the Jesus you have to believe in. Not Jesus from Colombia. You understand what I'm trying to say? Not any other Jesus, not an unresurrected Jesus. 
Not a Jesus that didn't go to Calvary or didn't die. So don't let people fool you with their nonsense religion telling you that we believe in Jesus, but we don't believe that he is, you know, God. And we don't believe you that he is, you know, uh, he's only a prophet. When my Bible tells me he's prophet, priest, and king. You understand? For if he that comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if he, you receive another spirit, which you have not received, another spirit, some other spirit, some other people being led by different spirit that is not the spirit of God, and you're receiving that, thinking that you receive the spirit of the Holy Ghost. You know how many people is speaking in all kind of nonsense talking about they have the Holy Ghost, but they have never encountered the Holy Ghost. You understand? Not because you can take A and put it with a B and add a C and a V to it does not make you filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm sorry. If we will receive another spirit which you have not received or another gospel which you have not accepted. So if it's not the first thing that you receive when you heard the word of God. If you begin to go after other things and accept other things. You are going to be in trouble. You might well bear with me for I suppose I was not a wit behind the very chiefest apostles. But though I be rude in speech he says. Paul was not playing. The man says, even if I'm, I'm rude in my speech, I'm, I'm trying to let you know the truth is the truth. You stick with the truth. Buy the truth, the Bible says, and sell it not. You understand? Though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but you, we have, have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that you might be exalted? Because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely. Paul says, I abased myself. I didn't charge you for the gospel. I preached it freely, freely. I received freely. I give. Amen. I robbed other churches, he says, taking wages of them to do you service. So you in Corinth, I went to another ch other churches and I, off I, got, I got offerings from them to help you out and bring them over to you. How did I do you wrong? And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man. He says, when I was present and I was in need, I did not beg nobody anything. For that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things, I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you. And so will I keep myself. Let me read here. Mighty God. <laughs> I keep getting this thing here about a permanent ban will be ensued if live video does not end within. Who is sending me this notification? And, and Until I see that being truth, then whatever. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you not, he says, wherefore, because I love you not, God forbid. God knows, right? But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. For such are the false prophets, the false apostles, right? Those that glory in themselves, right? Such are the false apostles, deceitful workers. So if the person who asked me that question is still here, then you can understand what I meant when I say there are people that attach them, themselves to the church, but they were not of God. You understand? And they were deceivers. That's why they do the things that they do, using the gospel for their own gain and their own benefit. You understand? For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. They are just people who are pretending, acting, pretending to be apostles of Christ, but they are not. And no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. You know that word, that transformed word? This is the word of, 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 of the devil. This is a devil's idea. He's always trying to transform. You understand? He transformed himself into an angel of light. He's getting people to transform into Christ-like people when they're not, but they're disguising their sheep in, in wolves, rather in sheep clothing. And so we see the same transformation happening in the world today. The devil is using the same method. He is not creative. He used the same idea over and over in a different way. So he's always trying to implement the same idea. You understand? In a different form. He, he, he tries.
tries to mess with people's mind very subtly and he tries to transform the mind and get them to transform into something that they were not created to be and get them to transform so the devil is the mastermind behind every trans whatever you hear going on in this world get it clearly the devil is the master mind amen behind every foolishness that you see going on in this world no marvel for satan himself is transformed into an angel of light therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness it's not a, it's not a mystery that you can have demonic people in the church operating and pretending to be ministers of light because they are being led by the same transforming spirit of satan you understand but the bible says that we must try the spirits that's why we must be at the place in the lord where we are we are, are what do you call it now we are immersed in him and so we are being led by the spirit of god and that we can discern you understand to know what is wrong and what is right to understand when somebody is being led by the spirit of God and when it is the spirit of the devil because let me tell you it is not too hard to spot it if you if you are in Christ and you're in the word daily yourself you will know when somebody is talking something that sounds good but check the scriptures and you will find a deviation you understand? Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So that means their end is going to be destruction because their work will not stand up before in the court of God. Amen. I say again, let no man think me a fool. If otherwise, yet as a fool, receive me that I may boast myself a little. That which I speak, I speak is not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in his conf in this confidence of boasting, seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. So Paul says what I'm about to say might sound stupid, but let me let me say it anyways. You understand? Because everybody wants to boast. I can boast also, he says. But he says, listen carefully now. Seeing that many glory after the flesh, they glory after the flesh because they're not in the spirit. So they're glorying. It's about what they do and how well they do and how good they are. They are glorying after the flesh. He says, I will glory also for you. Suffer fools gladly seeing you yourselves are wise. For you, for you suffer if a man bring you into bondage. If a man devour you, if a man take off you, if a man exalt you, if a man smite you on the face, it's like you allow everything. You allow them to go to get a, to do any and anything with you. That's what the word suffer there means. It doesn't mean suffering in the way that we know it, but it means allowing. Right? When he says you suffer, for you suffer if a man bring you into bondage. You allow them to bring you into bondage. You're so finicky. You allow people to bring you into abandon. You allow them to devour you. You allow them to take, you know, to, to take you and, and, and if they want to exalt you, they exalt you. You know, you allow them to smite you on the face. Whatever they want to do, do it. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Be very careful. I speak as concerning reproach, as though you had been weak. How, how be it? Wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly. I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? All right. Are you boasting because you're a Hebrew? Because there are some people who boast because, you know, there are people who boast because, you know, they were born in the church. When they were born, mommy and daddy was a Christian and they've been in the church. And I can't boast. You understand? My boasting is in the Lord Jesus Christ. I cannot boast about any of it. But there are people who will boast about certain things. I've been in the church, you know, many years I've been saved. And yet they don't have any power in God. But they don't see the fact that they're still weaklings. But they will boast about the length of years that they have been saved. You understand? I speak, he says, are, you, are they Hebrews? So am I. I can boast about that too because I'm a Hebrew. Are they Israelites? So am I. I can boast about that. I'm an Israelite. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. In this one, he says, I speak as a fool. Because what? He knows they're not ministers of Christ. They're demonic spirits. They're not of Christ. So he says, are they ministers of Christ? In brackets, I speak as a fool. I am more in labors, more abundant. I work harder than they do. 
in stripes above measure. I've been attacked and, 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 and beaten more than they have ever been. In prisons, more frequent. I've been thrown into prison for the gospel of Jesus Christ so many times. In death, oh my God, how many times I have I've come close to dying. That's what Paul was saying here. He's like, I can boast too, but I choose not to boast in these things. He says, of the Jews, I was five times received I 40 stripes, save one. So five times the Jews captured Paul and beat him 39 stripes. You understand? Because they were not allowed to give them the 40 because the 40th, they could die. That's how bad that beating was. The 40th one could be, you could take the life. So they, they would beat them to the brink of their life. Literally, like if I give you one more lash, you will die. That's how much they would beat him. He said, three times was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. That's three times, right? Shipwreck. A, a night and a day I have been in the deep. You understand? And then we've read the stories where the, 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 the boat that he was on was tossing people who were trying to jump out of board. And, and he says, these must stay in the ship or else they're going to die. We've gone through that story before. In journeys, often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, even the people that grow up with me and know me, trying to kill me just the same. In perils by the heathen, in perils by the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Paul says, I've been through it. I could boast about that. In weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, how many times have to go without food and water? In fastings, good God Almighty, have to put himself through fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without that which comes upon me daily, the care of all the churches. So he says, not only was I going through all of this stuff on the external, but imagine what I go through on the inside as well when I have to be taking care of the churches. Every day, people, people calling on me for this and that, people having problems over here. I have to be writing letters over here. I have to be visiting this church over here. Paul says, I've been through a lot. I could boast about that. All right? Who is weak, says Paul. Then he says, who is weak? You think I'm weak? You think when I come, oh my God, he sounds so, so puny and weak? After all that I've told you, who is weak? He says, I am not weak. Who is offended? And I burn not? Don't I go through problems? If I must needs glory, he says, if I should glory any at all, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities, right? The God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. He says, the only thing I glory about is the fact that I am going through so much trouble. The infirmities, I can glory in that to say, you know what? I suffered for Christ's sake. So let me glory in the Lord. Everything that I, I go through, I take it in stride and I glory in the Lord. I rejoice. The Bible says rejoice when you fall into diverse temptations. Count it all joy. You understand? So that's what Paul was saying. He's not saying that, you know, he's, he's thinking that his infirmities is going to get him into heaven. No, he says, I take joy in the fact that I know that I suffered all these things because of Jesus Christ. I count it all joy. Instead of complaining and murmuring about why me, why me? I said, thanks be to God that I was counted worthy to suffer for Christ. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knows that I lie not. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king, kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison desirous to apprehend me. These were people of authority, governors. They were making, they were, they were setting up roadblock. You understand? To try to apprehend uh, Paul, and he says, and though and through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped. The only how he was able to escape was because somebody put him in a basket and let him down by a window. Paul went through some stuff for this gospel. 
This gospel is free, guys, but it costs a lot. It cost a lot. It cost people like Paul a lot. It cost God, his only son. It cost Christ, his life. It cost a lot. So we should not take it lightly. Mighty God. Glory be to God. Hello, hello, my dear. We should not take it lightly. Mighty God. I give God glory this day. I thank the Lord. So we have gone through chapters 10 and chapters 11 that we have promised to go through today and i'm waiting for any questions if you guys have any questions feel free to ask me tomorrow i'm going to be finishing with second corinthians 12 and 13 okay so if anybody you're here you want to come back tomorrow between 11 uh, well 11 o'clock really but i sometimes i'm a little bit late coming on i'm doing my best but i'm going to be on at 11 tomorrow god be praised amen i tell you the word of god is truth it is right. And so let us not take it lightly, our salvation, guys. Let us not take it lightly because it's so easy. If I have information, <laughs> your question is, is a little bit vague, my dear. Do I have any information about Lucifer? The whole Bible is about Jesus Christ. And it tells you about the fight of, of Lucifer and Satan and how he's trying to 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 how he's trying to um to overturn the plan of God. Amen. What do you mean by if I have any information about Lucifer? What is your specific question? There's so much about Lucifer, but my focus is not on Lucifer. Lucifer is a defeated foe. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, that's kind of a large question indeed. So if you have a specific question that you want to ask about Lucifer because if we were to talk about Lucifer we could go on forever eh? but we're not interested in talking about Lucifer forever we're, I'm interested in talking about Jesus Jesus is the one that saved your soul from sin Lucifer is the one that is trying to destroy us yes the fallen angel right Lucifer was once um you know <laughs> oh my god Mighty God, let me just see here. Oh God, let me go. Yeah, you said I was sort of large in my um, in my thing. So I don't know about I I don't I don't want to talk about Lucifer right now because Lucifer there's too much to talk about him and I don't want to glorify Satan. I will not glorify Satan. Jesus is the light of the world and he is our we want to talk about him you know like i love to say let's talk about jesus the king of king is he the great i am the way the you know i want to talk about jesus amen so lucifer you will you 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 don't even have to talk about him he you you, you will feel you will see him in operation in the world look outside in the world and see the evil that's going on and you know what happened Lucifer is so conniving that he, he wants people to believe that it's God that's doing all the bad things. When God does good, nobody wants to praise God for the good. But when there is an evil that happened, you understand? All of a sudden, if, if, if God was to do a good work now, somebody would find a way to praise a man. They would say, oh my God, it was because, you know, President so-and-so decided to do, and it was because, and they would praise a man for what? The goodness of God. You understand? But, for example, I'll give you a very simple example. A very simple example. If God was to speak to somebody's heart, put it on somebody's mind, to go to such and such an, ad an, ad an, um, of, uh, an address, right? Somebody's house. And to bring them, you know, a basket of food or some meal or something. And they would go there and deliver them whatever it is that God tell them to do, right? The person would be so thankful. And if somebody catch wind of it, you know, the media, they would say this good Samaritan. And they would give praise to the individual who brings the food and the supply to this person who was in need. They would give praise to the individual. They would not talk about God. They would forget about the fact that the reason this person did it was because God put it on their heart to do it. God would get no glory. All right? Yet, if the situation was turned about where the devil comes and put in the person's heart... To go and attack this person in their home. 
and they go to that person's home and they break in and they assault that person and they do evil to that person and they mutilate or whatever they do to that person. You know what would happen? The, they, 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 and the media would get a hold of it. Maybe he, whatever he did to the family or whatnot, the media would get all of it. And you know what people would say? Where was God? Why did God allow this to happen? Why did God do this to this person? All of a sudden, God didn't get glory when the good was done, but God will get blamed when Satan is the one who puts evil in the heart of the people. Nobody would say, look what Satan did and Satan did. People would always give God the blame. You understand? And it's very sad. It's very sad because, you know, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Render to God what is God's. God is desire. desire. God re, um, is worthy, I should say, of glory. He's worthy of honor. He's worthy of praise. And where good is, that's God. God does not do evil. He doesn't tempt nobody. He is not doing evil to you. We bring evil upon ourselves. You know, you know, sometimes when we, when by the lust, when we allow ourselves to, to lust after things, we can bring evil upon ourselves. And evil comes because Satan is out there. People allowing themselves to be led by demonic spirits. When you get involved in demonic things, Satan, you give an open door to Satan to come here. We now, uh, uh, the believers of Christ, we have that power. We have those, um, we talk about it in the beginning here. That we have been given, we have been equipped, right? To be able to pull down strongholds, right? Isn't that what we said before? That we have been, we have been, we have been equipped to the pulling down of strongholds, right? That we can bring down these demonic strongholds, mighty God. And so that is what we have, the weapons of our warfare, yeah? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to pull down every stronghold. So that's what we have to use against the enemy. Not that we need to blame God when God, when the enemy does stuff. Recognize when Satan is at work and come into battle. Fight the good fight. Pray against these things. Warfare is prayer. And we have our faith. We have all kind of weapons that we can use against the enemy. We need to be fully armored. Amen. God bless you. I'm going to leave you guys. I got to go. Because I gotta work. Gotta pay the bill. All right. So God bless you and I love you all in Jesus' mighty name. I'm gonna end here TikTok and I'm gonna end here Facebook. Thank you so much for watching. Yes, my sister, the word of God is true. There is nothing, you know, mighty God. I love the Lord. I really do. <laughs> I love the Lord. I don't know. I just love God, eh? I love the Lord. He heard my cry. Amen. And pitied every groan. Amen. God bless you, my sister. Thank you very much. And uh, each and every one, you have yourself a fantastic day today. It's going to be great. I'll be back tomorrow. So tomorrow we're ending with uh, Corinthians, guys. First and second uh, Corinthians will be the end of it tomorrow. Second Corinthians chapter uh, 13 and 14. God bless you today. Amen. Bye.